So what I want to do this evening is I want to first just start, start just by talking a little bit about uh, the behavioral definition of autism. And I'm going to move, a, I'm going to talk a little about why I think uh, I've been interested in thinking about a biologically um, based approach to thinking about parsing the heterogeneity as opposed to behaviorally based approach. And I thought I would do that by talking a little bit of my journey through the genetics of autism. Uh, and then talk a little more recently about what I've been focusing on with genetically defined subgroups, and then really kind of hope to tie in with kind of what are the implications for clinical care. I am a, I am a clinician, and so at various, it's very important to me to think about how do, we, how do we link this to supporting families. So we'll, we'll start with that well-known phrase we all know. If you've met one child with autism, you've met one child with autism, uh, and which really speaks to what a wide variety, uh, uh, big... Um, uh, variability we see with, within autism. And so for a long time, we as a field have thought, well, maybe if we could figure out how to parse that a little bit, a bit, a little bit we might be able to identify uh, more appropriate treatments. We might be able to help inform families what, what uh, might be expected. And so that started a while back with, um, uh, with starting to define behaviorally defined subtypes. Uh, so as we know, um, when we talk about autism, it's right now defined behaviorally as deficits in social communication and interaction, as well as the presence of restricted repetitive interest behaviors. And, and for a while, we've thought, great, we've got this big, huge uh, umbrella. How do we parse that out? And so we had some initial terms that were uh, devi uh, devised, the aloof, the withdrawn, and the active but odd behaviorally defined subtypes of the 80s. Uh, and so those were proposed. There was some research that was done in, in, in that realm. And then, uh, of course, uh, the American Psychiatric uh, Association came along and said, you know what? That's fine, but we've got some other behaviorally defined subtypes we want to utilize. We're going to utilize uh, autistic disorder, Asperger's syndrome, and PDD NOS. So, uh, and we did a lot of research uh, using those behaviorally defined uh, subtypes. And uh, I think what, what emerged over those 20 years of work thinking about that was it was difficult to, for us to find uh, any connections between etiology to these defined subgroups of PDD NOS, Asperger's syndrome, or autistic disorder. Uh, it was unclear about how we might apply treatments to each of those behaviorally defined subtypes. So as a, as a clinician, if a family came in and I went through and said, OK, yep, clearly we, we have a diagnosis of autism. And um, you, Joey, uh, meet criteria for Asperger's uh, syndrome. Uh, and you, uh, Billy, you, have a, you meet criteria for autistic disorder. There wasn't a particular treatment I would say, oh, this is definitely going to work for you, but not for you. And so there wasn't really clear utility at the, at the, uh, at the um, intervention level. Uh, and then uh, we did some work which showed that even really good diagnosticians were actually not so good at figuring out which kiddo would fit into which of those behaviorally defined subtypes. Uh, and so we've moved, obviously, to the DSM-5, where we now look at a uh, big, more umbrella term, which I think allows us then to think about We've got a big, broad umbrella term. Now we can think, great, might there be other ways we might think about subtyping, and perhaps a genetic first approach might, might come into play. But I want to take just two seconds to talk about uh, how we, well, how me as a clinician felt horribly dismayed at my inability to appropriately diagnose at the subtype level. So I just want to share some of my, uh, my own sort of like, oh, holy cow, we're supposed to be good at this. Uh, and this really stems from some work that we do with the Simon Simpux collection. And which I'll talk a little bit more, a little bit uh, talk more about later. But essentially, the Simon Simpux collection was a, uh, a collaboration funded by the Simon Foundation to really focus on gene discovery and specifically looking for particular types of genetic events um, in families where there's only one child that's di diagnosed with autism. So that was the focus of this project to bring together really around gene discovery. And uh, what we were able to do across 12 sites around uh, North America was work together collaboratively to do exactly the same thing at all 12 sites in terms of our data collection processes so that we could end up with a large uh, number of families for, for whom we had clear characterization that was all done in the exact same way. Because prior to that, there was great work going on in genetics, right? So at the University of Washington, there's great science going on. There's great science going on you know, up, up at uh, Yale, great science going on. At Vanderbilt, all places around. But everyone was doing something a little bit differently. Uh, and so it made it difficult for us to think about um, on a big scale how we can move forward. So uh, what we did with the Simon Simplex Collection is we made sure that across all our sites we were doing uh, our gold standard diagnostic tools, the ADI and ADOS, doing them exactly the same way by 
video recording everything we did and then shipping those tapes out to all the other all the sites and we would watch the sites from Chicago and we'd watch the uh, sorry the tapes from uh, the Chicago site we'd watch the tapes from the Boston site they'd be watching our our tapes I spent a lot of time watching ADIs and ADOS tapes uh, I could probably have sort of had a whole other career had I not watched so many tapes but it was great because it allowed us to make sure we're doing exactly the same uh, the, the same things exactly the same way um, so we had very clear criteria uh, about um, who uh, met inclusion criteria for this uh, particular study. Uh, and what we did not do, to clarify, is we did not specify at that diagnostic subtype level, autistic disorder, Asperger's syndrome, or PD, NOS, um, any other ways beyond the DSM-5. We figured, oh, well, we're all expert diagnosticians. We, uh, we can all use the manual, it's the DSM-5, or DSM-4, sorry, at the time. We can use DSM-4, and we can use that manual to define who's going to fit once we've met criteria on the ADI and ADOS, which diagnostic subtype uh, you would fit into. So, great. We went ahead and worked with, um, ended up being close to 3,000 families across, uh, uh, across this project. Uh, and what turned out, when we looked at all the data across the different sites, this is some preliminary data from that uh, subset, we found that we were, across all the states, we're all seeing the same types of kids. And so what this uh, complicated slide just shows is the x-axis shows the different sites, the, the y-axis is a different measure, each of the different measures we were using, and this is just a sample of the many, many, many variables we looked at. Uh, so up in the upper left, we got our verbal IQ measure. Uh, each of those points is the average functioning, um, mean functioning at a given site on that variable. The red, the red indicator just happens to be the UW site, which is the data that I got. But anyway, you can take a quick look at this, and this is the same for all the measures we looked. There was no one site that was um, looking at kids that were any, any particularly different. So we're all seeing the same types of kids. There was no one site that had kids that were, uh, uh, that were in much higher uh, rate of, um, of behavioral disturbances. There was no one site that had a lot of kids that were minimally verbal. We're seeing all the same types of kids. So when we looked across site at which kids uh, met diagnostic criteria at the subtype level, here's where things started to, to look pretty different. So uh, again, on the x-axis, we have the sites. On the y-axis is the proportion of individuals who were uh, diagnosed either with autistic disorder, PDD, NOS, or Asperger's syndrome. And so you can quickly see that we all saw the same types of kids. Uh, site G only saw kids with autistic disorder. Uh, site L, about half the kids had autistic disorder. Um, uh, um, a portion had PDD, NOS, and a small portion had Asperger's syndrome. We saw that all the same kids, but yet this, at this level, it was totally and wholly idiosyncratic. So expert diagnosticians, we were not doing a very good job uh, of making these um, diagnoses at this, subtype, at this subtype level. So for me as a clinician, I was like, oh, well, that's a little bit embarrassing. But it's OK. Uh, it is what it is. And so we thought, maybe now that we move to the DSM-5, we can uh, open up new opportunities to think about how we might uh, subtype. So, so given that, my story in that sort of uh, venture to answer this question started back in the 90s when I first got involved in, in autism genetics. And um, back in the 90s, I got involved uh, with Susan Folstein working on using the cutting edge genetic technology of the day, linkage analysis. Uh, and so what my job as a master's level diagnostician at the time was to drive all over New England, work with families, uh, multiplex families, families who were two or more individuals diagnosed with autism, I would go spend the day with families, doing the ADOS, doing the ADI, doing a whole array of phenotypic assessments. And at the end of the day, I'd whip out my phlebotomy kit and I would draw blood on the kitchen table or the bathroom floor or whatever worked for the family. Uh, and then I would head back to the office and um, we sort of work with our sample. So I did it for uh, a couple years working on uh, with multiplex families. And then Susan Folstein says to me, she says, you know, Rafe, this is great. You've been driving all over New England. Thanks so much for that, collecting all these multiplex families. But you know, really, when you look at autism as a whole, that accounts for about 20% of families with autism. The vast majority of families with autism are simplex families. So I want you to get back in that car, and now I want you to find all the families where, there, where there's one child with autism. And then ideally, I'd like you to find families where there's a second uh, sibling who does not have autism. And maybe it's kind of like. Uh, super normal, so to speak. So a, a child who's super flexible and super social and wants you to find those families. Get back in the car. And so sure enough, I did. I was young. That's what you do. Um, so I drove all around uh, New England again, collecting all these simplex families. Uh, and that was great. And uh, so 
then I got married though, which is also great. Um, but I got married and then my wife says, you know what, uh, we're gonna join the Peace Corps. And I said, oh, okay. Like any good husband, I did exactly what she said. And I said, okay, we're gonna join the Peace Corps. So much to Susan's dismay, I sort of then jettisoned off, uh, having collected a, we collected a pretty large sample of multiplex families and a pretty large sample of simplex families. And here's where sort of my naive, autism, uh, naive optimism shows is that we left for the Peace Corps and I remember sitting on this uh, sort of white sand beach in the South Pacific, which is where we were placed. And I thought to myself, self, I've done a horrible thing. They're gonna find the genes for autism without me. This is horrible. Anyway, I sort of laugh now as I sort of look back, but that's, that's where I was, uh, you know, nearly 20 years ago. So at any rate, um, I'm sort of digressing a little with my story about Susan, I apologize, I should really stay focused. So, uh, so the cutting edge technology of the day, what we ended up doing was this uh, linkage study. Uh, we published our findings in 1999, uh, right around the same time that IMSAC uh, published their findings. And, this, uh, and really what emerged, and what has since emerged was, well, it's kind of complicated with the smaller samples we were doing. Uh, you know, we had about 250 families in our, in our study. Uh, we weren't finding a lot of hits. We, we had found this sort of a, a potential point on chromosome seven, a potential uh, region for candidate genes on chromosome 13, and we were really excited. But you know what? No one else was able to replicate that. We weren't replicating what other people were finding using this linkage, uh, linkage uh, approach. So that happened. I'm hanging out in, in the Peace Corps, and then where things started to change, uh, was uh, Mike Wiggler and Jonathan Sebat, who were uh, at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, they thought, you know what, we've got some new technology, and we might be able to think about the genetics of autism by focusing not on this notion that we've got uh, uh, multiple genes acting in concert together that might uh, confer risk and uh, help lead us to think about where there might be candidate uh, genes in the genome, but what if we use our newer technology to look for tiny structural changes in the genome called copy number variants, looking for really tiny uh, deletions or really tiny duplications throughout the genome that are de novo, that mom and dad don't have. So these are new events that arise where there's just a, a change in the, uh, and the number of, well, the size of a region of a given uh, chromosome, maybe we would think about it. These copy number variants, so tiny structural changes. So they said, okay, well, what do we need to do? Well, there's this great resource uh, called Agree. Let's utilize that resource. Oh, and there's also, wait a minute, didn't Rafe and Susan collect a whole bunch of simplex families? Whatever happened to them? What did Susan, did she retire? What happened to Rafe? Anyway, they said, well, here's this great resource. Let's go ahead, um, reached out, were able to share that resource, and they were able to, um, to look at the rate of these de novo copy number variations in multiplex families that we've been studying for a long time uh, as a field with collaborative, um, these linkage studies, uh, and then also look at these simplex families. And what they found in this uh, uh, study back, they published in 2007, was that simplex families, the simplex families we found, that there was a much higher rate of these de novo events emerging, so these tiny structural changes, are finding a much higher rate uh, in these simplex families relative to the multiplex families. About 10% of these simplex families were, were showing these uh, de novo mutations. So that became really informative uh, in that Mike Wiggler had a good buddy uh, named Jim Simons who had uh, started up a foundation. And he said, Jim, I got this idea, and here's the idea. If we apply this new technology, we might help us, it might help us think about uh, what's going on in terms of etiology for autism at a genetics level. But what I need is like 3,000 simplex families. So can you make that happen? And Jim said, well, I'll see what I can do. Um, and so put together, organized the Simon Simplex Collection, which I had sort of mentioned earlier. Originally the goal with this, with this collaboration was to bring together to focus on 2,000 families, and as scientists are off, or want to do, about partway through said, you know what, we could really do this, we could use a few more people, that would be really ideal, and so we increased the numbers to uh, about uh, almost 3,000 families. Again, the goal here was to be utilizing this sample to think about de novo events, these uh, copy number variants. So uh, we did uh, a study, a uh, uh, full analysis of that sample, uh, and this is work that was done um, in collaboration with Evan Eichler. Evan, Eich Evan Eichler's team was driving this CMB analysis with uh, postdoc in his lab, Santosh. And uh, this just complicated, busy slide just highlights that when looking at the Simon Simplex collection in blue compared to a couple uh, comparison cohorts, a, a large cohort of individuals with developmental delay and, and number of uh, typical controls, we started to see just a pretty broad array of copy number variants. So these were de novo events that emerged, but they weren't just in one particular location. They were really kind of throughout the genome. I'm highlighting at this, at this first scan when looking at these structural changes, 
we found a lot of different structural changes that might be conferring autism risk. What we found, particularly, was that the most common event was uh, duplication or deletion on chromosome 16 at region 16, P11.2, kind of there in, uh, in blue there on that uh, left-hand side of the, uh, of the screen. So that was one piece. The other, the other little uh, piece when we were doing this paper, I just want to highlight, because I'm a clinician, I'm very interested in thinking about how this relates to behavior, um, was we want to look at the size of the type of, uh, the size of this event, the size of CNV, seemed to relate to uh, some aspects of the phenotype. So we have here is just um, a correlation that we looked at. The size of a copy number variant, be it a deletion or duplication, so the size of the chunk of DNA that's, um, that is different, we'll say, um, relative to what we'd anticipate. Um, for duplications, there was no connection or relationship between, um, uh, no correlation between the size of duplication and uh, cognitive ability. Um, and for deletions, there was no relationship between the size of that deletion and, uh, and autism symptomatology. However, what we found was as the size of your deletion grows, the larger the deletion, we found uh, there was a, a greater decrement to uh, cognitive functioning at nonverbal level. And with a dupl uh, duplication, the size of the duplication is correlated with the degree of autism symptoms, sort of judged uh, using the calibrated severity score on the ADOS. So for us, we, set, we realized, OK, great. We see a lot of uh, heterogeneity in the types of genetic events we're seeing within the Simon Simpox collection, a lot of different types of CNVs. And we see a, a nice relationship based on the size of the event, not just the location, but the size of the event and how it relates to the phenotype. So that was, that was our work using this, this uh, sample to understand copy number variations. But as I mentioned a second ago, 16P11.2 was the most common event. And so uh, in chatting with the Simons Foundation, we we're enthusiastic, naively, enthusiastic that maybe if we focused only on 16P11.2, we might be able to help inform our understanding of autism specifically. So naively, we got very excited. Maybe I should say I was naive. Maybe everyone else had a really good sort of accurate understanding of what was going to happen. But I was sort of just, yes, this is great. This is going to be amazing. We uh, started the Simons VIP study uh, to really build on this notion of a genetics first approach. So what I've been doing uh, in Seattle prior to this, what I've been working uh, in collaboration with Evan Eichler, we've been doing a genetics first approach looking at CNVs in the Seattle area um, by doing real uh, brief phenotyping at the beginning. That is, we collect information about family. Oh, has there been a diagnosis of autism or other neurodevelopmental disorder? We're going to gather some basic information, do a, uh, our screening at the time, or uh, looking for copy number variants, and then recontact the family and go and really understand the phenotype better at that point. That was kind of our approach, which we adopted uh, broadly with the Simons Foundation in our Simons VIP study. So we established a really nice website. We reached out to all the medical genetics clinics around the country and said, hey, do you have anyone that you know of that has a 16P11.2 copy number variant? Send them our way. Put them in touch with our website. We'll get them enrolled in our study. And then we had three different data collection sites. It was uh, us up in uh, Seattle, uh, down at Baylor College of Medicine at uh, Boston Children's. And we'll bring families in, and we'll really try to understand 16P11.2. Uh, so we had a very comprehensive battery, which highlights all the different things we did over the course of a three-day period. We'd fly families in, we'd pay for their trip, we'd support them all the way, the whole family would come. We'd collect information from mom, dad, child with a 16P1.2 event, as well as a family member, and we would do a lot. And these families were wonderful, and they would come to Seattle even in the wintertime when it's rainy and gross, and they would hang out with us, and we would really try to look more, very broadly at the phenotype. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, neurocognitively, as well as we collected a lot of other information, kind of dysmorphology and neurology. So the first kid that walked through the door uh, was a 15-year-old boy uh, from Texas that uh, came in to see us in Seattle. And he had a diagnosis of autism uh, on, on the way in. And I remember uh, sitting, we did our interviewing, we did all of our, our characterization. I sat down, I was doing the ADOS with him, and I was thinking to myself, huh, I realize he's got a diagnosis of autism. But, you know, to me, what I'm seeing instead that might be driving some of these challenges, that to me I see a speech sound disorder, I'm seeing some expressive language challenges, and um, I see a kiddo who's got an IQ, it's about 75, 80. And I really wonder if that might be what's driving some of these challenges as opposed to um, is this sort of, is this autism? So that was our, my first indication that, huh, Maybe by focusing only on 16P1B2, I'm not going to have all the answers I thought about autism. But 
Who knows, that was just my first kid. So, um, but go, 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 and we started to see that same pattern over and over, uh, where individuals are coming in with a diagnosis of autism, but on close, clear uh, inspection, really we're seeing a lot of speech sound disorders, uh, expressive language disorders, uh, and sort of this uh, IQ around 80 or so. Uh, and that was, uh, that was the case for everyone. About 20% of our individuals that came through the door actually had uh, met criteria or strict criteria using the ADOS and ADI on, uh, for an autism diagnosis. Um, uh, but it wasn't sort of that, I'm gonna nail it, I'm gonna understand autism wholly by focusing on 16P1.2. I suppose there's, there's probably previous uh, research that's been done with other copy and variants which could have been formed this and I would have sort of maybe not had that same level of, of optimism. But uh, at any rate, um, I'm young. So, uh, so what, what ended up happening, just to give you a quick summary of, uh, of what we saw. So we worked with a total of 140 uh, individuals with a 16P1.2 deletion, and a, a little over 100 uh, individuals with duplication. Again, these, these are individuals that are ascertained based on, initially on uh, some sort of clinical challenge, and then we would do cascade genetic testing with everyone else in the family. So there are a number of individuals that, were, that we saw who had a 16P1.2 event that we didn't identify because there was a clinical challenge, but because, oh, it just so happens that sibling has 16P1.2, and it turns out, oh, when we do our cascade testing, other sibling, who seems relatively typical, uh, 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 has that uh, particular event, and the same thing with parents as well. So this is kind of what uh, the summary of uh, across both uh, individuals with the deletion on the left and individuals with the du duplication on the right. And there's just a, a handful of things I selected out. Um, so as I mentioned, about 20% of our individuals met criteria for autism. The more frequent diagnoses for our deletions, as I mentioned, was speech sound disorder, uh, la expressive language disorders, uh, and developmental coordination disorder. So really kind of this motor component to, uh, to development. Our duplications also developmental coordination disorder and much higher rates of intellectual disability and ADHD. Uh, about 90% of our deletion cases had at least one DSM diagnosis. That means about 9% of our deletions and almost 20% uh, almost of our duplication cases did not have any psychiatric uh, diagnosis. Um, and then there was uh, a couple interesting uh, mirror phenotypes that we, that we picked up. So um, about 24% of our deletion cases had macrocephaly, and we saw microcephaly in about a fifth of our duplication uh, patients. So kind of interesting uh, head size um, uh, mirror phenotype, and this has been replicated, recapitulated in animal models. A much higher rate of seizures in our deletions, uh, and then we've got the same sort of mirror phenotype in terms of obesity, a much higher rate of obesity in our uh, individual deletions relative to our individual duplications. And in fact, we had a number of individuals with duplication who had failure to thrive, so kind of uh, that mirror phenotype. So that's what we saw. Uh, we, what we're also able to do with the same sample is take advantage of the fact that we were, that because of our ascertain approach, of, of looking broadly, we ended up seeing a lot of kids who were pretty young, uh, even as young as six months of age. And so we thought, well, what if we were able to uh, follow these individuals uh, over the course of development? And uh, so we were able to uh, follow these kids from six months of age to about eight years of age uh, with this caveat was that no, we didn't start following kids at six, all kids at six months of age because we would start them any time that they came into the study as long as they were under eight uh, and that we would be able to see them at least three times, we would uh, follow them. So it's a, you know, just because of the rarity of the sample, that was kind of one of the challenges. But uh, so we were able to follow them. And these are, I'll just highlight just some brief findings from a paper we just published. Well, actually, I think it's not out yet. It's in press. But um, where we looked at... Um, uh, sort of longitudinal trajectory. So I'll just sort of walk you through this very complicated slide for a second. So we followed 56 kids of our almost 200 kids um, who had either deletion or duplication, and we followed them uh, once they entered the study. Most of our kids were starting around three years of age, and we were following them until they were about, uh, till about eight uh, or seven. Um, and uh, Essentially, the take home, what I'll show you in, the, uh, in these sort of complicated slides, what we have in green is the actual assessment data over time across a number of different um, variables. So we've got, um, uh, on the left-hand side, we've got our deletions. On the right-hand side, we've got our duplications. And this is looking at adaptive uh, functioning on the Vineland. Uh, the green lines show the actual scores. The yellows are our, um, uh, our, our trajectories that we calculated based on our observations. And the black line shows the, the mean performance for uh, for the group on a particular um, adaptive measure. Essentially what we found over the, this, uh, in our longitudinal study was that we saw, we saw some pretty clear declines uh, that were subtle but significant in both social functioning and motor functioning for our individuals 16P1.2 in this, er, uh, this early development. Um, 
for our duplication cases, we're not seeing that same sort of decline. We're actually seeing, while, while we're starting out um, uh, relatively impaired in that kind of that uh, uh, around 80, 85 in terms of standard scores on adaptive functioning. So kind of uh, low average, uh, low, uh, low scores. Um, but they maintained pretty steady. They were developing at that same pace, even though they were um, uh, about a standard deviation, a little bit more uh, below average. But we're not seeing a decline. We're seeing that decline in, uh, for our deletions. But you also might notice as you look at this as well, gosh, those, those little green lines and yellow lines are kind of all over the map. There's a lot of variability even within this uh, genetically defined subgroup. And so thinking, well, huh, for this particular group, how might we think about that heterogeneity even within uh, this genetically defined subgroup? And we thought about this in two different ways. Uh, one was to think about it in, uh, in terms of relation to what we might expect given uh, parental background. So this is what we reported in uh, uh, one of our earlier projects. We looked at simply uh, SRS scores, so performance on um, uh, parent report of parent or other report, uh, social uh, responsiveness scale. And what we see here on the on the x-axis are, are uh, SRS scores. In uh, green is our siblings, in blue is our parents, and our red is our probands with individuals uh, with 16p1.2, and these are deletions only. And what we were able to look at was a, there was a real clear correlation in terms of parent SRS scores uh, and proband SRS scores, or strong correlations between sibling SRS and, and parent SRS. Uh, and so we could really kind of quantify, maybe, what the decrement would be to having a 16p11.2 deletion. And that's roughly that relative to what we'd expect in terms of parent performance on SRS, is that about a 1.7 standard deviation shift, uh, deviation, in, uh, in terms of proband performance. So the way of thinking about, well, what might we expect? We might expect that we're gonna have social responsive scores that are similar to what the parents have, and turns out that we have a, about a 1.7 standard deviation uh, hit to social functioning as a, as a con, uh, consequence of 16p1.2. So that was one way to think about that variability, that it's gonna be driven largely by, well, what, if, what would we expect based on parents' performance on particular measures? We did this not only with social ability, but we did this also uh, with motor functioning, uh, and cognition, yeah, social motor cognition, uh, and uh, and we find that sort of same sort of pattern across different domains of, of functioning. So um, that was one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is what other factors might be contributing to that heterogeneity. And this is uh, some work that a fellow in my lab has been working on. It's kind of hard to see, so I'll, let me walk you through this this slide. On the left hand slide, we're, uh, left hand side of the slide, we're looking at. Uh, individual deletions. On the right-hand side, we're looking at duplications. And what we did with this project, what this uh, fellow did with this project, is we uh, were able to uh, work again with uh, Evan Eichler and one of the, the doctoral students in Evan's lab um, who completed exome sequencing on all of our 16p11.2 individuals. Uh, we looked uh, very closely at uh, early history for these individuals, both at the prenatal and perinatal history, to try to understand uh, what other complications have occurred for a given individual, track that down. We had a very uh, clear, standardized medical history interview that we did as part of our battery. Uh, we looked at gender, uh, and we looked at the presence of other uh, genetic events, either a secondary copy number variant or uh, a mutation to a particular gene uh, from a number of genes that we're interested in, uh, ASD-associated genes. Essentially, what we found, just sort of to boil it down, um, was that there was a number of the, there were a number of factors when we plugged all these uh, factors into our simple regression model. A number of factors that were driving some of that heterogeneity we were seeing in uh, uh, in different domains of, of functioning. So, up in the upper left-hand uh, corner here, we're looking at the different. Uh, variables that might predict some of the heterogeneity in deletion cases in terms of autism severity. We use the autism severity score uh, for this measure. And what we found is that the presence of a perinatal event, uh, and we uh, have very clear definitions of what a perinatal event uh, consisted of, but also consisted of maternal age, paternal age, um, uh, infection during pregnancy, um, and the presence of uh, a gene mutation that was sufficiently rare. We had a couple different cutoffs, so we used a CAD score of uh, over 20. Uh, and so those two factors, uh, in, com in combination with the deletion, were driving much of the variability we were seeing within this population. Um, and we broke that down specifically in terms of social affect, in terms of repetitive behaviors. And uh, again, we sort of see this, uh, uh, the perinatal offense uh, uh, playing a, a contributory role there uh, in terms of social functioning, which mirrors some, uh, some other research that's looked at um, the effect of, obviously, the work that uh, some of us done here in terms of uh, uh, perinatal events and impacting uh, phenotype. 
We also found a nice protective uh, effect for sex. So uh, females with 16p1.2 tended to be less impaired uh, in terms of uh, some of the functioning. So we found a nice clear signal for other factors that were contributing to heterogeneity, including uh, environmental exposures, as well as the presence of other genetic events. Uh, and then also um, for, for the duplication case, it's a very different story. We're not seeing the same pattern and understanding the, uh, the heterogeneity. The only factor that uh, emerged as, as relevant was uh, gender. So uh, females with the duplication uh, tended to be doing much better. And I sort of think about this anecdotally. A lot of what we were seeing in our sample was uh, individuals with 16p1.2 duplication who were impaired, and then uh, mom would be a carrier, and mom was pretty darn typical. Um, we're not seeing any sort of uh, other impairments with our moms, and that's kind of really what's driving some of this, this finding here. So that's a little bit about thinking about heterogeneity within a given uh, uh, genotype. So that was one avenue of research that we're very much continuing to pursue, but there's been this whole other line of research that has uh, had nothing to do with copying and variance, and I want to spend a little time talking about that. Uh, and uh, this kind of started in 2009, actually, when we started working on this, was I was working with uh, uh, a postdoc in, uh, again, in collaboration with Evan Eichler, working with a postdoc who, uh, where we could apply some new technology, sort of moving away from looking at copy number variants, but actually using exome sequencing, where we could sequence all the gene coding regions of the genome and uh, see if we can identify, again, these de novo events. So what uh, Brian Roke and I uh, did is we sat down for a long time. We thought, well, what? If we're trying to enrich our sample for identifying de novo events, what should we look for? And so we thought, well, let's for, look for families where uh, it's a simplex family, where there's no history in the family of any other uh, uh, psychiatric disorders and no history of autism. And let's uh, let's find um, individuals with autism who are who are pretty impaired uh, cognitively and have, uh, uh, in terms of autism symptomatology, seem to be pretty pretty challenged. So we identified um, 20 individuals we thought fit the bill. Um, no family history of mental illness, uh, no broader autism phenotype in any of the family members, um, and kiddos who were significantly impacted by autism symptoms. And in that sample of 20, we did uh, sequenced all the gene coding regions of the genome, using exome sequencing, and in that sample we found uh, gene disrupting mutations in four of those individuals. Uh, and these uh, just so turns out, when looking at these four individuals of this group of 20 who were already very impaired, uh, these four were even more impaired. And uh, so we're pretty excited at this point. Holy cow, we found these four genes. This is so exciting. Again, my naive optimism started sort of shooting. I said, this is great. We can convince someone to give us some money. We'll do this in a much larger sample. Let's do it. Yes. And so we did. Uh, we were able to um, uh, convince the Simons Foundation to do this in a much uh, bigger way with a much bigger sample. And we uh, then replicated the same exact process with 209 individuals with autism. And here, my optimism kind of just deflated a little bit. So what we did find was in about 25% of our sample, about 50 of our kids, uh, we found a large number of neurologically expressed gene disrupting mutations. So we found de novo events, de novo mutations, that is mom and dad weren't carrying these mutations. Uh, and many of these kids carried more than one. Uh, we found a total of 248 sort of dispersed among these 50 kids or so. But here's where it got really depressing. So well, there were only two genes that we found any recurrence with. There was, we found two individuals who had a disruption to uh, CHG8, and two individuals had a disruption to NTNG1. So I was like, wow, that's a lot of different genes that are disrupted in a sample of, uh, of 200 individuals. And this is really only counting for about 50 of these kids. So based on this number of mutations we identified, based on our sample size, based on the potential mutations that we think could be playing a role, our estimate was there about somewhere between 400 and 821 different autism risk genes that might be playing a role. There's a same, uh, there was a, a paper published in the same issue of Nature um, coming out of the Yale team doing very similar type of work using a different, um, uh, a different approach. Um, and their estimate was about 1,000 different autism risk genes. And so whew, that's a little bit deflating in terms of thinking, oh, we're not going to find it. This is crazy and complicated. But, but. What was exciting um, was that when we look at some of these gene, uh, these gene events, many of them seem to be interacting as part of a, a, a protein uh, network. And we thought, OK, so many of these genes are interacting together. What if we took that bit of information and utilized that to apply some even newer technology? So uh, Jay Shanduri uh, at the University of Washington had uh, developed uh, a new type of sequencing approach where you could sequence a, uh, a given gene. Uh, 
much more cheaply than sort of sequencing a, uh, the whole um, exome. And so it's called uh, MIP sequencing. And so we could now do some targeted sequencing in much larger numbers. So we said, well, let's focus only on those genes that were part of that network that we identified, about 44 genes in that network. And what if we were to sequence just those 44 genes in like a couple thousand families? Let's use the SSC and we'll just sequence all these folks for these genes that we're pretty confident about. And so we did that. And in our 44 individuals, uh, sorry, our 44 genes, we finally started to see some recurrence. We found the same genes that were disrupted in multiple kids. Yippee! The most common was we found that nine of those individuals had a disruption to the CHG8 gene. Woohoo! Nine! Very exciting! Um, so, uh, Pretty fired up about that, um, uh, and but we did find some other recurrence. We had found uh, four individuals uh, who had DERK1A mutations, four individuals had P10 mutations. Uh, so at least we started to feel a little more confident about some of these genes. Um, and what was interesting, again, for me as a, as a clinician as I look at this is that these particular genes also related to phenotype in very specific ways. And so what we were able to do um, broadly was use a head size as an indicator. We had head size on everyone in our sample, um, it's relatively easy phenotype for us to, to capture. And uh, so what we see here in, in our slide uh, is uh, the, uh, the normal curve there is in um, uh, dotted lines. The SSC broadly is there in the shaded, uh, shaded domain. So we see a, a slight shift in overall head size, so much uh, to larger heads in our sample largely. And then we plotted each individual in different colors. So our th uh, we have three of the, of the four kids there um, with zirk one a mutations, uh, much very high rate of microcephaly, very small heads. We have our individual with P10 plotted in black, macrocephaly, and our individual with CHD8 also with much larger heads, many of whom uh, met criteria for macrocephaly. So we started to see distinct genetic events with distinct relationships to phenotype. And then, because I'm ever optimistic, I thought, well, let's take a look at these nine individuals with CHD8 events. Let's see if we, uh, that might be informative. There's, there's only nine of them, but let's see what happens. So I went back and looked, and it turns out that uh, two of them happened to uh, live in Washington State, and actually had come through my lab at some point in the, in the couple years preceding. So I just gave him a call and said, hey, we found something. We think it might be related to, to your child's autism. Would you be willing to come on in and talk with us? And so I said, sure enough, be happy to come on in. Uh, and so first, first kid that walked the door was as cute as a button, little 12-year-old girl. She came in literally like three days after I gave the phone call. Uh, she came in with her mom and uh, clearly had autism, kind of, uh, we kind of did the, the LADOS, the lobby ADOS type of situation. It was pretty clear um, right off the bat she had autism. Uh, she also had intellectual disability. And we sat down and did our testing, um, kind of was sitting with her. What I, what I noticed was slightly wide set eyes, this hypertelorism. She had uh, certainly a broad uh, forehead and, and large head, um, slightly downward slanted palpable fissures. Uh, subtle, but you know, I'm sort of making notes. And in chatting with mom and dad, um, she had really profound um, gastrointestinal uh, challenges, significant constipation historically. She jotted that down. And mom and dad reported significant sleep problems. Uh, she would sometimes not sleep for a couple of days at a time. They would have to lock her in a tent and sort of zip it and lock it just so they could get some sleep. They were very loving families. They just want to clarify, but they just needed some sleep. Um, so they would uh, uh, sort of lock her up in the tent. Um, you know, I wrote this down, but I'm like, yeah, we hear about this, you know, we hear about this a lot. I'm, you know, I'm going to write this down, but I'm not going to sort of uh, make anything of it necessarily. But uh, a couple of days later, the other child came in. He's an uh, eight-year-old boy. Um, again, clearly has autism walking through the door. We could sort of tell that. Um, also a large head, prominent forehead, um, uh, slightly, um, uh, slight hypertelorism, slightly downward center of palpable fissures. So I'm like, okay. So I'm taking some notes. Um, in, uh, uh, in chatting with mom and dad, um, he, too, had significant sleep challenges, wouldn't sleep for a couple of days at a time, had significant GI problems. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to write this down. Two out of two, okay, I'm just going to write it down. I'm not, I'm not jumping to conclusions. Um, but what we were then able to do um, was reach out to folks uh, kind of around the world who had uh, individuals who had a CHG8 event. These are just a, a handful of the folks from around the world that, um, that we were able to work with. Uh, and we started to see some, some patterns that emerged. So, Consistently, we were seeing autism. Consistently, we were seeing GI problems. A good portion of these kids also had sleep problems. Um, uh, many of these kids also had the macrocephaly and uh, some of the other facial features. And so we'll start to put this together. So we first reported on this in 15 individuals um, where we identified out of uh, a little over 3,000 cases. 
Importantly, what we never found, and we've now been doing this, we've been ex extending this work uh, up till today, we've now seen 27 individuals and, and uh, looked in much larger numbers of controls and, and siblings, um, but we've never once found a uh, gene disrupting mutation to CHG8 in any siblings or any typical controls. We've only seen individuals uh, that were identified through either clinic or through research studies with autism um, or intellectual disability cohorts. Um, and so this is research where we looked at even more, uh, identifying 22, and now since then we've even seen even more. So um, to me, I was sort of enthusiastic. Wow, okay, we've got some similar patterns. Um, we're starting to see a recurrent um, profile for these individuals, and we're not seeing this in individuals who don't um, uh, have autism or intellectual disability. So now this is, again, this is uh, a slide from, uh, haven't updated with the, the most recent two kids, but. So, so far, 23 of the 25 individuals that we've worked with um, have met strict diagnostic criteria for autism. The two folks that don't haven't actually been able to see. So one of the, one of the individuals is a 44-year-old woman, uh, she's 44 now, 44-year-old uh, woman who's been hospitalized or uh, institutionalized in Italy since she was a child. She, she diagnosed she has our um, uh, uh, psychotic disorder and intellectual disability. So I haven't seen her. She might have autism, I don't know. Um, and the other was an individual from uh, the Netherlands who also had the uh, same diagnosis. Uh, so I'm not sure what that means, but so 23 to 25 are meet strict diagnostic criteria for autism. Uh, again, I'm, I'm pretty confident because we've not found this in any, any other typical controls, any siblings only see this in autism. I'm pretty, uh, pretty confident about the role it's playing in autism. Um, importantly, only about half of the individuals we've seen have intellectual disability. I think that's relevant given that many of the other single genes that we've identified, I'll just talk briefly about some of the others, uh, many of those are associated with uh, intellectual disability. In fact, we haven't seen um, individuals without intellectual disability with some of those uh, de novo mutations. But here we see one where it sort of spans the range in terms of cognitive functioning. Um, I already mentioned some of the facial features and physical features. I mentioned the gastrointestinal problems. Um, we've also seen a number of uh, folks, uh, we've seen fewer females, those we have seen, um, uh, seem to show up with precocious puberty. So we did, uh, following this, we said, well, let's make sure we understand uh, when and where uh, CHD8 is expressed in, uh, in the brain. We see this expressed early on in development, uh, nine to 14 weeks uh, post-conception. Um, we see that it's uh, expressed in regions that have been implicated in autism uh, before, so pretty confident about kind of the, the role in terms of that. What we also uh, did was we worked with a collaborator at Duke University who studies zebrafish. And we said, Nico, can you take a look in your zebrafish and see what happens if you, uh, if you uh, uh, sort of knock down CHG8 in, in your zebrafish? And so he said, sure enough, no problem, we can do that. And uh, what Nico found was that these zebrafish have big heads. Uh, and so he said, okay, great. So we're able to recapitulate this aspect of the phenotype in, a, in an animal model. We could be, you know, lends credence and confidence to our finding. And then we said, Nico, the other thing we've noticed is that these folks, uh, these uh, individuals we're seeing have significant gastrointestinal problems. And he said, well, I can handle that too. So he said, let's get some zebrafish. And he, what he would do is he would feed these zebrafish little fluorescent pellets. He would feed the pellets and he would just track how long it takes for these pellets to pass through the GI system. Well, it turns out these poor little fish don't poo. So, um, so again, recapitulating that aspect of the phenotype, we could be a little more confident about the, the work that, was, that we were finding in, in our individuals. So uh, I'm glad I don't do that sort of line of research, but that was the work that Nico was doing. Um, um, but here we could lend credence and confidence to the finding that, um, that CHG8 is tied to the phenotype that we're seeing. Uh, with our zebrafish, we weren't able to look at uh, social functioning, repetitive, uh, repetitive behaviors, but Someone's doing that work somewhere, right? They got to figure that out. Social, social activity, zebrafish. Um, okay. Um, so this next slide just sort of captures what uh, what this model is then, in thinking about uh, this genetics first approach. So um, autism is a uh, heterogeneous disorder. Specifically, we've identified that it's incredibly genetically heterogeneous. I already highlighted. There's many copy number variants that are contributing. There's almost uh, somewhere about a thousand different single genes that we think are contributing. Um, but if we do targeted um, uh, sequencing of uh, particular genes of interest, we can then go back and identify patients who have similar uh, genetic um, uh, events, go back, follow up, understand, the uh, understand those families, um, do animal modeling, do expression analysis to, to provide confidence that this particular gene event is related to the phenotype and that there might be a particular uh, subtype. Um, with CHD, specifically, we highlighted some of the features. And what we did then was we established 
a, a small website just to sort of uh, let some of this information be known and uh, make it available for clinicians to connect and um, find out a little about CHGA, but also report information they've, they've got. Uh, we also uh, helped facilitate and start a, um, a Facebook program for our CHD families, just put families in, in touch. And what we've been able to see really nicely with CHD, and we've done this now with many other uh, single gene events, is, um, you know, as you guys know with some of the work you guys have done, that these family groups can really pull together and become very informative for each other, very, very helpful, very supportive, uh, uh, both in terms of providing a nice identity, but also providing real helpful, useful, practical tips and strategies for each other. Uh, and so we've uh, done that with, with CHG8. Now we've done this with um, uh, a number of other different uh, types of events. So we've done this now with ADMP, DERK1A, uh, a couple of other copy number variants. We actually just had yesterday a, a paper that was accepted looking at uh, PPM1D. Um, so uh, the same sort of process whereby we can use genetics first uh, thinking to identify uh, particular subtypes based on that, on that biological uh, definition. What I would love to do is talk about each of these in, uh, in general, but I want to make sure we're leaving time for questions. So I'm going to uh, jump, jump ahead here just to talk for a second about another aspect or way we've been looking at um, uh, the phenotype, and that is by looking at using EEG. Uh, so EEG, what EEG is, electrical activity recorded in the scalp. Uh, what we do is, specifically what I've been interested in, is looking at um, a particular rhythm in the brain called the mu rhythm, which is electrical activity uh, or neural activity that's recorded from central channels, kind of up here. Uh, and uh, uh, it's in the 8 to 13 hertz frequency band. And what's uh, interesting about the mu rhythm is um, when an individual at rest, when you're sort of sitting down, casually, we get a very clear signature, um, clear oscillations of uh, uh, similar amplitude. Uh, and when an individual is executing an action, like if I'm going to go here and grab my glass of water, we see attenuation of that, um, of that, uh, the power in that, in that spectra. Or interestingly, if you were to observe someone else performing that same action, if I were to observe someone else reaching out for that glass of water, we're going to get similar attenuation of that uh, neuronal signal. Uh, so sort of reducing that mu amplitude. So this was actually first reported back in the 50s. What uh, uh, electrophysiologists were doing is they were watching, uh, they were showing people pictures of uh, little boxing movies, people punching each other, and they were finding, ah, it's sort of funny research, but that's all good. Um, anyway, what they were finding was that when people are punching each other, they were sort of getting this, uh, uh, this reduction in EEG uh, signal. So we were interested, I was interested in this as a graduate student, um, uh, uh, and so looked at this in autism broadly. Uh, essentially, I'll sort of, sort of capture what I found. We had showed individuals uh, simple grasping actions, grab a little block of wood, which we named the manipulandum, thought that's kind of fun, um, grab this little block of wood. And what we found are typical individuals, uh, they're in light purple, we found um, uh, similar degrees of attenuation of this system. So we see uh, that uh, attenuation is just highlighting here. Similar degrees when both executing or, or observing an action as we'd anticipate with our adults with autism, um, we didn't see that same degree of attenuation. W uh, we saw similar degrees when you're executing an action, but not when observing someone before the perform the simple action. So we published that uh, uh, many years ago. There's been a number of studies that have looked at this since, and we're seeing a lot of variability in the findings. Some findings, some folks are finding similar findings, differences between uh, groups. Other folks are not finding those, uh, those groups. Even uh, we ourselves. Um, uh, failed to replicate that group difference, but found very similar correlations with aspects of social cognition, specifically we were looking at imitation. So uh, that's just a by way of quick background um, uh, as I sort of finish up here. So what we've been doing is showing uh, uh, aspects of that are in our behavioral repertoire, so biologically, uh, biological movement, as well as comparing that to non-biological motion, and looking at uh, this mu rhythm attenuation uh, when uh, when simply just watching and observing biological motion or non-biological motion. So uh, real briefly here, uh, uh, what we found, um, this is a complicated slide, so I'm going to walk us through. OK, so up here is just highlighting the electrodes we were using. We uh, looked at this as a uh, preliminary work where we looked at a group of 13 individuals with typical development, uh, 13 individuals with ASD that are with idiopathic ASD as of today, I would say. So that is, we couldn't identify any particular gene events uh, associated for that individual, as well as individuals with a likely gene disrupting mutation, about 13. Uh, and so when we look at a diagnostic level, um, looking at mu rhythm functioning, both in upper mu and lower mu, and there's reasons to think about 
dividing that power spectrum in a couple of different ways. Um, we uh, sort of replicated earlier findings of group differences between, um, uh, well, I should clarify, it's a little more complicated than that. We found appropriate difference between social and non-social information for our typical individuals. We'd expect to find differences there. We found that for individuals with autism with lower mu, which is a more of a, uh, a basic sensory processing um, aspect of, uh, of this system, uh, but no differences between social and non-social information at sort of a higher order uh, aspect of, of processing this, this biological motion. So that's, that's fine. This is preliminary. I'm not going to make too much of it um, at the diagnostic level. This is kind of what's mirroring what's, what's out there in the literature. Um, but what I was interested in, again, with small numbers, but interested in thinking about how this might work for individuals with likely gene-disrupting mutations. And so uh, here's where, for me, it's sort of interesting. As able to look at the different types of mutations that each, each individual had and group them based using uh, Aya Savab's uh, functional network grouping. And I was interested in thinking about, for individuals who have gene mutations that are expressed very, very, very early on in development, embryonically expressed, uh, uh, genes that are embryonically expressed who have mutations to those genes, and compare that to the individuals in our sample who have gene-disrupting mutations, but which are expressed much later in development. Well, not much later, a little bit later in development, I should say. Um, and so, uh, so here, at this uh, upper level, sort of a higher, uh, sort of people think about it as kind of a higher uh, cognitive uh, uh, sort of component to, to mu, not finding any differences um, between our social and non-social conditions um, uh, within our embryonic express group or our non-embryonic express group. However, for those individuals who had gene disrupting mutations later in development, that's where we start to see um, uh, differences in processing social and non-social information at this sort of basic sensory level. So. Again, this is preliminary. I just want to highlight this is kind of some of the direction that we're going with in our research because I think that this might prove informative as we think about how to uh, interpret some of our phenotypic information in the context of uh, uh, different gene, gene groups. So in my last couple minutes, uh, what does all this mean? So I'm spending all this time thinking about the science and thinking about genetics. So how, what does that relate? So, What's exciting is that we know about many of these genes that we identified. We know, uh, we're learning uh, about where they're expressed, when they're expressed, how they're expressed, um, what those proteins are doing in the brain. And that helps us start to think about, well, are there might, be, might there be ways we can intervene? Uh, and so uh, there's different ways to think about it. Um, so I'm sort of jumping ahead here. By identifying the particular proteins that disrupted, we could start to think about, are there some novel, uh, novel compounds that we could use? Or could we use some existing compounds in novel ways for individuals for whom we might think there's a specific reason that that compound fits for that protein disruption? So that's one way to think about, and that's we're still a, a couple years down the line, but we've been doing this with uh, other uh, uh, single gene events for a while. Uh, right here, so we know that um, this is a, a potentially uh, um, a possible way to go. Um, also possible, might we think about this as uh, helping us identify who might be responders to existing treatments. But there's other things, other implications for this genetics first approach. For many families, just having that genetic background and genetic information just provides some answers. It, even though it's maybe not a, a uh, it's not a full answer, but it provides a degree of an answer. Okay, I can understand, okay, this is kind of how this happened. Um, and that can be very helpful. Um, for some of these uh, gene events, we can already start to see that there's some real guidance for how we want to monitor and provide support. Um, so CHG uh, patients that are coming through the door, I know that we're going to be paying attention to, uh, to sleep and GI issues significantly. Uh, the GI issues, uh, I think, become very relevant in that we've worked with a couple adults now with CHG8 uh, mutations. and. For both of those adults, they both ended up with colon cancer. Um, we know that CHG8 is implicated in cancer, and now we've got an example of individuals who have GI disturbances and end up with colon cancer. Uh, we didn't make, we sort of loosely highlighted that in our paper. We kind of kept it um, preliminary, so we didn't sort of make a big, a big point about it. But I think it is important for us to be thinking about. We haven't seen enough adults yet now really to understand, but that's definitely something I'm, I'm paying attention to. Uh, you know, other examples, things like uh, increased likelihood of seizures for our individuals with 16p1.2 deletion. So there's some real, um, there's some real clear benefits for thinking about how we want to monitor and care for our patients based on what we know um, about events. Uh, the other piece I already mentioned was that that sense of community can be so important for many of our families. Um, there's already some really well-established um, communities around SCN2A, DERK1A, uh, CHG8, and um, again, that's been able to provide some clear support for families as well as um, uh, sort of that, that real uh, practical information, practical tools, tips. These things work for our family. How about for yours? So 
to summarize, having now chatted you for a long, for a long hour, I'm just sort of throwing information at you. Um, uh, what's the take home? So lots of heterogeneity in autism, we all know this, um, um, but I, I, so my position would be that these genetically defined subtypes, uh, they, they provide, they're subtle, but they provide real, um, they're real subgroups that we can think about. Um, and again, by identifying these genetic mechanisms, moving forward with uh, clear uh, subgroups, we can think about targeted treatments, we can think about um, ways to help inform course and prognosis for our families, as well as provide that sort of sense of community. So with that, I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna say thank you very much for for listening to me this afternoon, I really appreciate it. I want to thank a big thanks to my collaborators, uh, Evan Eicher, Holly, uh, Heather Metherid, Holly Stessman, Brian Roke, uh, a lot of folks, and then thanks to my lab, and uh, thanks to the families. The families are great. They really come and hang out in Seattle with me for two or three days at a time. How awesome is that? They're so wonderful. Anyway, thank you very much. Hi there. On Hi. one of your slides, you showed uh, 75% of the sample in this exome slide did have a, uh, or did not have any, any, any duplication or any deletion. Uh, was that number f to be uh, extrapolated to all of the uh, population of uh, autism spectrum patients, that 75% would not have a genetic mechanism, or are you postulating that it's a higher fraction than, or, or is the fraction as high as 25% of uh, the patients that you uh, discovered uh, sure. uh, genetic issues. Yeah, so so that particular that particular side I was highlighting from our uh, our first initial um, exome sequencing uh, study. So that was where we had a very small sample, we had 20 individuals we identified in about 25% uh, single gene events, single gene mutations uh, that were de novo. So that was from that small sample. When we look larger at, at bigger numbers, when we because. I wouldn't draw any conclusions based on that on that small sample, but when we look larger at when we've sequenced uh, the whole of the Simon Simplex collection, which isn't going to represent all of autism, right? Because that's really simplex families, which are we've sort of targeted in theory for the presence, uh, the likelihood of a presence of a de novo event, because we've in the Simon Simplex collection we've sort of screened out anyone who has a family history of autism. We screen out families where there's more than one individual with autism. Uh, and so we're really targeting a particular family type. But, but, but we've sequenced that, that sample very well. So in that group, the numbers and estimates we think about, it's about 10% of those individuals have a copy number variant, this a deletion or duplication, particular type of genetic event. About 25% of that, of that sample, uh, different 25% in many cases, but sometimes there's overlap as well. Um, but about 25% of that sample has a de novo single gene mutation. That's a disruptive mutation. So that's a, uh, the, the protein isn't being created, the truncating mutation. Uh, and then, but that's not all. So then we've, we've been doing more is looking at what about other variants that don't disrupt the, the don't have a clear disruption to the, to the protein. That is, it doesn't stop it from creating its protein, but it's a pretty rare or unusual variant, a, a rare version of that gene. And that accounts for another chunk of a percentage of the Simon Simplex collection. And then on top of that, there's a number of mutations that, uh, variants that when, um, uh, when mom has that variant, or when a sister has that variant, or uh, a female sibling, uh, we don't see autism. But if a male has that particular variant, then we see autism. So, and that accounts for another chunk or so of, of, that, of that group. So depending on the sample, depending on how you read it, in terms of identifying an event that's playing a, a, a likely contributory role, we're somewhere between 35 and 45 percent. Again, it depends on the sample, depends on the paper, depends on what you're reading, but kind of in there. That's a sort of a safe number. There's some folks that say, ah, oh, we can look at about 55%, but I think a, safe, a safer number would be somewhere in that, in that. Does that help answer your question? Okay, thank you. Yes, oh yeah. Hi, I'm one of the geneticists here at Mind Institute, great. and your talk was great. Oh, great. Gives reason why every patient who walks in here should have a genetic testing. <laughs> My question, though, is uh, CHD8, mm -hmm. What's the connect, what do you know about the function of the protein mm -hmm. um, that connects autism to the sleep disorders mm -hmm. and then to the GI right. motility? Yeah, so great questions. I might actually sort of highlight here some of the expertise right here in your own building with Alex to answer some of those more specific questions. Um, so the sleep, the sleep relation is, that's a good question, right? So that's a very good question. 
the sleep disturbance we identified don't actually reach significance when you compare to the large sample. What we did to look at sleep, uh, look at rates of sleep disturbance, um, was we simply said, okay, great, what percentage of our CHD uh, individuals have a sleep disturbance? And this is grossly measured, right? This is based on a, a standardized medical history interview that was done uh, prior to even understanding what the genetic event was. Um, so I sort of like, basically, I trusted a little bit more, right? It wasn't like I was digging. Like, I wasn't like, oh, hey, wait, might, might there be a sleep challenge here? I'm going to keep asking because I heard about it over there. But this is all done sort of in a standardized way before we even knew what the genetic event was. So, um, uh, so a, a, a good, sizable um, uh, portion of our kids had these sleep disturbances. But when compared to uh, sleep disturbance rates in autism broadly, we used the Simon Simplex collection as our comparison core. It didn't reach significance. Um, it was close. But I think what's interesting about this, and uh, this, again, this is more from an anecdotal perspective, is these sleep challenges were pretty profound for a couple of these kids. Like, not sleeping for a couple of days is pretty darn profound, right? It's not like a typical, ah, oh, I wasn't sleeping so well. Like, so, so I believe it, you know, as sort of in hearing from families, but, um, but I don't, I have, I have no idea what the connection might be. So if, uh, zero, that was just uh, me making this observation in, in a standardized way, and I, and I believe it, but um, I don't know what the mechanism would be. Um, and then the GI motility, that was the other question, right? So uh, good question. Well, we know that CHG8 is expressed in the, expressed in the enteric nervous system. So um, how might that be disrupting? Again, I'm not sure what the particular mechanism might be there specifically. I'm just, I guess, confident that we now have seen this in two different species, the same sort of pattern of uh, disrupted gut motility. And I think it actually opens up more doors for more questions than actually sort of definitively answers any questions. I'm sorry, that was like total, two total non-answers. I'm sorry. That's a <laughs> Good evening. Does being female provide some protection against genetic mutations in autism homogeneity? Um, great question. So um, uh, I, w I guess I would answer that question this way. I would say being female provides uh, protective effect for having an autism diagnosis. I would sort of state it that way. Um, what we know is that uh, you know the uh, the ratio of boys to girls diagnosed with autism, uh, you know, about three or four to one um, in an as in a group ascertained for having autism. But in, if you look at a group ascertained for having a genetic event, that ratio drops down much lower to almost a one to one, depending on the sample, or two to one. Uh, so in that case. It's not necessarily protective of, of having a genetic mutation, but it's protective of having uh, um, of autism. So one of the things I will highlight is we, uh, we looked at the presence, and this is actually really work that Evan Eichler drove. I just kind of helped out in thinking about the, the families. This is work that he was, he was doing. Um, looking at uh, uh, rare variants of particular genes, and if a uh, boy had that rare variant, or if a girl had that rare variant, what would happen? And so that's where we see, start, start to see, for some of these genes, very um, distinct differences. The boys that have this rare variant would end up with autism. The girls wouldn't, at least not uh, at, the, at that gross level of autism, yes or no. We don't yet know if there were uh, presence of other features. And actually, we got, just got funded for a, a follow-up hour one to actually look just at that, the broader phenotype, potential broader phenotype traits in women, um, um, girls or, or adults uh, with, uh, with those particular gene, gene variants. So that, that's, again, sort of, I guess, that's a, I guess I feel like that's a solid answer. OK, great. Okay, great. <laughs> Just want to make sure I wasn't having all total non-answers. OK, great. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my question is related to the EEG mu rhythm yeah. um, results that you presented. So the, um, the study that you're running are you specifying the frequency band a priori, so like eight to 13 hertz? And then I saw that you divided by like lower alpha and upper alpha. Yeah, yeah. And then if you did, have you thought about um, kind of um, specifying the frequency at which each individual operates mm -hmm. um, instead of just kind of averaging, you know, eight to 13 hertz? Because um, I think we, like in the mu rhythm literature, Yes. There's a lot of heterogeneity and in individual yes. differences at which, at what frequency people operate, mm -hmm. you know, with the mu frequency band. So yeah, great question. So so we've done this different way, a number of different ways. We've got we've looked at mu in a, a handful of different ways and different, different studies. For this particular preliminary data I was presenting here today, uh, we have at this point just looked broadly. We haven't identified a particular. Um, 
uh, specific frequency or a given individual. For some of our other paradigms, we've definitely done that. We've done that easily because we've had both execute conditions and observed conditions. With this paradigm I was presenting here, uh, this is there. There is no execute condition. What we've done when we've had an execute and an observed condition, we use that execute condition to define what that person, that individual's mu frequency band would be, and then we can use that to inform ob the observed condition. Uh, because for this particular data, we only had the observed. We haven't we didn't haven't identified. We've been looking sort of grossly at um, these broader bands. But it's totally key piece, especially about mu rhythm. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. It sounds like you've done some work in this. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Cool. Cool. That's great. So this is also a question about the EEG. Yeah. Uh, first, did you do eye tracking? Great question. And no, we did not. And I would love to. We did. What we did is we monitor very clearly. Uh, Obviously, it's not the level of resolution of eye tracking, but we're monitoring at least to make sure that folks are attending uh, and uh, attending to the screen. Grossly. But not to the actual object not at the, the instant object. that it was on the screen. Yeah. Second question is, what's your interpretation of the mu suppression to non-social stimuli? Mm -hmm. and, and what defines non-social? Two very good questions. All right, so for us, why, we, why I think we're seeing a little bit, you know, a little bit of suppression um, uh, is Truly, just simply, we're sort of attending. We're attending to the uh, to the screen, and we're getting additional noise. I, I think that sort of that some of that suppression is, is just noise in the data, um, honestly. And th the rationale being, we would anticipate that we wouldn't see any suppression of mu, mu rhythm function when observing. Uh, behaviors that are outside our behavioral repertoire. In theory, what we should be seeing is only mu suppression uh, when we're seeing things that are, are part of our execution system, right? Something that's within our behavioral repertoire. So we, in theory, shouldn't be seeing anything at all um, uh, if there's. Well, well, so exactly, right. So, so there's, there's a little bit of, there's, uh, there then becomes a little bit of that noise in there. So, so I think that's kind of what's driving. And other folks have found that some degrees of suppression to uh, uh, to a range of, of behaviors. But I guess your second question is, what is social behavior, right? What is, what is, so, well, that, that's a great question. For us, we were using um, biological movement, we were using a dancer doing a dance, which a quick little side story is that um, I was reading this article about this scientist uh, in England who was studying how college women perceived dance moves in, uh, male dancers and so I was like this is totally bizarre research but okay and so what this guy was doing was he was showing um, uh, showing uh, these avatars dancing and then having college women rate how attractive this avatar was and anyway I learned a lot about what good dance moves are and what bad dance moves are but anyway yeah. so that's what we that's what we used and we used the ball bouncing so so I'm, I'm, I'm asking a little rotation of that okay. which has to do with if you have autism mm -hmm and you have, say, certain object fixations or mm -hmm. connections to, sure. the, th the dopaminergic hit, if you mm -hmm. will, that you I get see, from the objects mm -hmm. may be for you, very similar to what other people get from or people. Mm -hmm. sure. And so if you then actually think about the relationship to a non-living mm -hmm. but object that mm -hmm. is connected, it's essentially something that overlaps with social experience. I'm thinking Great of point. Kelly Dobson's um, Blendy video. Mm -hmm. She is a faculty member at RISD, Rhode Island School mm -hmm. of Design, who has autism and has an extraordinary video of making a sound like a blender. She's, a, she's an electro mm -hmm. electronic engineer, computer scientist, artist. And she kind of made a blender that goes, you growl, you go, and then the thing turns on and starts matching your frequency. Hmm. So that's a kind of social interaction with a non-living object. Right. So right. I, when I'm asking it, that's I mean, it, right. do you? I, I totally, I, I see your question, right? So, so I guess that becomes a question as well, is Mu going to capture, is it going to capture um, uh, sort of that component, right? So in theory, Mu should be capturing that which is within our behavioral repertoire and not so much a social versus non-social. Uh, and so... Yeah, sure, right, exactly, yeah, totally, totally, yeah. I think it's a very interesting point in, in sort of thinking about then how we're capturing those sorts of asp uh, those components. Uh, an interest that is unusual, something that's been tagged as emotionally salient for you, how might that be playing a role? Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. Are the genes that you're identifying in your families without a an history of, of autism, uh -huh. the de novo mutation, yeah. do you suppose that the genes that you identify in those studies uh -huh 
would be the same genes that you would identify looking at fam uh, families with a history of autism? Yes, totally. Uh, it's totally entirely possible. Um, again, the work that we've been doing has been from these simplex studies uh, just to drive it, just to increase the likelihood we'd find these de novo mutations. We, found, we have found some of these uh, uh, gene events, uh, many of them, in multiplex families. In fact, 16p1.2 is a great example of that. So 16p1.2 was uh, reported long, many years before we started thinking about it uh, at this level, um, in um, a multiplex family where Two kids with, had autism. One of the kids had a 16p1.2 event. The other kid did not. And so it was actually sort of early on discarded. Like, well, that seems that can't be playing a role because look, these both these kids have autism, and it doesn't make sense. But you now we sort of learn that there's lots of different variants. So, so yes, it's uh, entirely could be uh, related to uh, identified in families where there's a history for sure, uh, as well as in multiplex families. Uh, from the clinician's perspective, can you uh, give us any insight as to whether we should be ordering uh, whole genomic sequencing, looking for additional hits, and uh, how does that up the rate of hits? And related to that, are you seeing any microRNA dysregulation? Are there certain ones that stand out more than others in terms of regulating gene expression? Yeah, so, so two good questions. So. Uh, so this is from my perspective, is that uh, I think that everyone, the way, we, the way I'm pushing for it up in Seattle, is everyone walks through the door at our clinic, we want to provide the opportunity, if they're interested, to provide um, uh, a blood sample for DNA analysis. And what we're doing uh, at the clinical level, we're going to recommend exome sequencing if we can get it funded. But we're doing this on the research level because we anticipate doing whole genome at some point. I think we just don't know, again, my perspective, I don't think we yet know enough from whole genome sequence to figure out how we're going to inform, but I think that's where we're going to go pretty soon. And so having it in advance, having those samples ready, I think can be conformative for families. But at a clinical level, what we, I recommend when I go to medical genetics is exome sequencing. Um, it's sometimes a little easier to get that funded, actually, up in Seattle and Washington State. For whatever reason, they sort of, uh, sort of say, oh, I'm copying them, you know, or microarrays aren't doing anything, but they haven't caught on that uh, and sort of still think, oh, exome sequencing, that sounds like it's really helpful. And so, so insurance companies are still uh, sort of uh, supporting it, at least up in Washington State right now. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, preliminary data on uh, whole genome sequencing. I think he would be one of the first. That yes, have th something there is some. Related. I guess I would. I would say let's have Evan come down and talk about that. I don't want to sort of put words in his mouth. Um, don't want to step on any toes. You know, he's a great collaborator. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.